Hey everyone, welcome to our online service this week. My name's Andy and I'm the Digital Ministry Director here at Bridgepoint. I want to say a special welcome if you are joining us for the first time. Please say hi in the live chat or leave a comment on this video if you're watching this on demand. If you're new, we really would love to connect with you. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure that you guys know that there's some service time changes coming over the Christmas season. On the 24th, we'll be having our online Christmas Eve services at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. And then on Christmas Day, our service will be available on demand only on our YouTube channel. It will be available to view from about 9 a.m. so that you can watch it at any point during your Christmas celebrations. The following week, our service on Sunday, January 1st will be at 10.45 a.m. and will be the only live service that we do that day. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. All that information is available in the weekly update in our app and on our website. And we'll also be going out in our weekly emails. So make sure you check those things ahead of time so that you don't miss out on anything that's happening over the next few weeks. One last thing to let you all know about is that next Sunday we'll be celebrating communion together. So while you're out shopping this week, make sure you pick up some bread and juice if you wanna participate in that with us. Okay, so that's all from me. I hope you guys enjoy the service. God bless everyone. Good morning. We have a Christmas classic for you this morning. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Yes, it is a worship service, but it is the Christmas season. So we're starting off with a Christmas tune to get the energy going, the blood flowing. Glad you are here today. If you're joining us online or here in the room with us at Tyrone, especially if it's your first time, welcome. We're honored that you would spend this hour, this moment, this time with us here at Bridgepoint Church. God is doing some amazing things in and through Bridgepoint Church. And we would love for you to be a part of it. So afterwards, feel free to introduce yourself. Stop by in the atrium at the info counter, get a gift bag. There's a coffee mug in there and some information about how you can uh, get connected or just information about who we are as a church. But again, welcome. Today is a good day to be joining us. If it is your first time, we're gonna be celebrating baptisms later in this service. This is where you get excited because you're gonna have to get excited later. It's a significant moment in the life of the church, but also for these individuals who are professing their faith 
in Jesus Christ who we've come to worship and hear from this morning. Friends, I told the last service, I'm kind of looking around like a robot because I slept on my neck wrong and I've got a crick in my neck. Gabe and I were debating, is it a, is it a crank in your neck, a crook in your neck, a kink in your neck? It's a crick in your neck. So take that information. That's a gift to you. That's free today. But if you see me uh, looking at you odd, it's not that I'm mad and just facing you. It's that I'm hurt. I'm broken. I'm sore. But here's the thing. Quick jump to, it may not be a, a, a sore neck. It may not be that you slept on it wrong. Maybe you're here today and you're feeling like there's just something that's uncomfortable in life, that there's a part of you that just doesn't feel right or it's not 100%. If that's you, I want you to know that you are in the right place, that you are welcome here and all of us, wherever we are, whether life is great and we're singing on the mountaintops or we find ourselves in the valley with a kink crick in your neck. You're welcome in this place and we trust that God has something for us as a community and that God has something special for us Individually, So I wanna encourage you and invite you to open yourself up to what God has for us today. So listen, as we transition into a time of worship for a moment, let's stand, turn to somebody around you, introduce yourself, say what's up, and we'll get going. Some of y'all look like you got a crank in your necks too, man. The way y'all are greeting. What's this? Come on. Rotate, rotate. Hey, friends, uh, we're glad that you're here. And again, just to reiterate, today is Baptism Sunday. And I think it's so cool to be a part of moments like this because you'll see people here up on stage towards the end of the service that you may not even know their names you might have never seen them before in your life, and yet you get to play a part that is so monumental in their life. And I think there's something powerful about that. And I think there's something really powerful, the fact that we get to worship now in this time before they go up on stage towards the end of this today's service. I think there's something special about setting the table or, or setting this room right with the presence of God by opening ourselves in this time of worship. And so that's what our ask is of you, is that would you be open to the possibility that God wants to do something in your life right now in this moment? Not wait until the message or wait until the baptism or wait till you get home, but right now, before the message, before the baptism occurs, God's stirring something up inside of us here and now in this time of worship. So would we open ourselves up to him? Church, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Let's worship together. All right, let's worship, family. Come on, everybody clap your hands, move around, let's put our focus on King Jesus.
And not just in this season, God, but every single day of the year. God, you are so worthy. And we, we are unworthy. And yet you love us. You love us unconditionally. And we are so grateful. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your powerful, precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
All right, Merry Christmas, Bridgepoint. How are we doing? Everybody feeling good? There we go. Oh, come, let us adore him together. Maybe today we adore him because we've got some first time guests, some of which is the first time in church in a long time. I'm just excited about what God has in store for you. Maybe adoring him today is the potential or the work that he's currently doing or wants to do in your life that through today's moment of, of worship and hearing from God's word, the Bible that might unlock in you a movement of God that'd be incredibly powerful. Maybe adoring him today is to be grateful for a God that is at work work in the life of our church. We've seen baptisms here and at other campuses this morning, symbols of life change. We'll see some more today. And maybe you've heard uh, some of the recaps of our vision nights or you were at a vision night and just excited about the momentum it seems like God is creating here at Bridgepoint. I'm so excited. Merry Christmas. This is the uh, a season where we celebrate the beginning of all that God put into motion that you and I could have a space to stand and declare uh, the love of God and experience it together. If you've missed any of these two messages, get on YouTube or the Bridgepoint app, catch up on those. We've got really good feedback, but for the sake of today, I wanna jump in with a really high level question, all right? This is the one that's gonna make every pageant girl's dreams come on fire together this morning. Let me ask you this, what do you think? Is peace on earth really possible? Every pageant girl says that they're working for world peace, amen, I'm glad that they are, but... Is that really a thing? I mean, it's, it's a buzzword. Peace is a buzzword at Christmas time. It's one of those things that we throw out and say, Christmas was so that peace would come to earth. But is peace on earth really possible? And here's why I ask that. Maybe I'm alone in this. I don't think that I am. But is our world peaceful? <laughs> I mean, last time I checked, if I look at my social media feed, then I'd be like, mm, yeah, I'm not sure there is peace on earth. I mean, if you're watching the news faithfully and religiously, I'd say why, but that would point to an indication of a lack of peace, right? If you keep in tune with global events, things going on all around the world, but I mean, let's not even make it global. Is peace possible in your life? Is it possible in mine? And, and how, how, let's go, let's go a step further with this. If, if Christmas is one of those times that one of the reasons Jesus came was to bring peace, then the, maybe the next subsequent question we need to ask ourselves is, did he fail at that? <laughs> I mean, is our world an indication that it, 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 his offering of peace wasn't good enough or it wasn't right? Or it, are, are we wrong in thinking that Jesus could even make that happen? Like something has to give because our world isn't fully peaceful. And yet at Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus came to bring peace. So are those two things really possible? What, what's the gap? What's the difference? And just to make sure I wasn't the dumbest one in the room, I came prepared with the folks of Oxford to define what we're talking about with, feet, with peace. They said, peace is a freedom from disturbance or tranquility. So again, is your life peaceful? And if I could answer that, I've seen some of the way, you, some, the way some of you drive. <laughs> I don't think you're peaceful people. I've seen what some of you post. I don't think you're a peaceful people. And, and, and just to be honest and to get a little bit serious, our campus pastors have walked with enough of you through life events over these past few weeks to know that some of you are carrying the weight of loss, a, a burden of heaviness of, of financial tensions or relational dysfunction and brokenness. Some of you are carrying really heavy burdens right now stemming from addictions or poor choices or, or difficult circumstances and yet we say that Jesus brought peace. So what, what gives? If, if tranquility, if freedom from disturbance, if that was the goal, where is it at? Like, where did Jesus put it? What, what, did it, what did he mean by that? Just to sound really impressive, I did a Google of uh, surveys of peaceful sounds, okay? Maybe you'll relate to this. This was the most recent one that I could find on just general life sounds, 2014, most peaceful sounds. This was put on by a, uh, a radio network. They said the most peaceful sounds are the voice of your favorite radio personality. <laughs> Interesting enough, apparently people still listen to the radio. And that's surprising. Um, you know, the days of Paul Harvey are kind of gone. Another, another survey response was the peaceful sound that they most resonate with is the sound of a beer can opening. <laughs> and maybe that's why we're struggling to find peace in America because that's the sound, barbecue crackling, or how about some people, a, a top response was mail landing in the mailbox. Number one, did you know people are still sending mail? And number two, apparently there's people sitting next to their mailbox to hear it drop in there. 
I, I had no idea that this was a thing. Some other responses were a crowd cheering a touchdown, which sounds really good unless your team is like mine in Auburn and we didn't have many of those today. And in which case to hear cheering for a touchdown is really anxiety because it must be the other team. People said bread popping out of the toaster or water boiling. Again, is this what you people are living to hear sounds of? There's so much more to this great world that we live in. A champagne cork popping. Uh, we got an amen in the crowd, all right? Again, <laughs> maybe, we, maybe it's not a big surprise that our world's struggling to find peace. But I also found Better Sleep put out an article in 2020 of the most peaceful sounds to listen to when you're going to sleep. This one was pretty common in the earlier services is the sounds of water, any kind of water, rain, ocean, rivers, kind of those, those sounds. For me, those types of sounds at bedtime lead me to the bathroom to deal with other types of water, so that's not my piece. Some people say it's nature sounds or just white noise or calming music or even the sounds of, of an oscillating fan. I mean, all of us know this thought. We have an idea of what peace sounds like, of what it looks like. Like we've sat at the beach, some of our beaches, and seen a sunset and thought, man, this is peaceful. And then we go back home, <laughs> Or then we head back to work the next day, or then, then we go on about our lives, and then suddenly where, where does that peace go? And so I did, I did my own digging, my own research, and I've come up with some things that I think most folks would really resonate with. Peace to a parent, it's coming from a parent of a, of a second grader and a kindergartner. Peace is when somebody comes to me and says, let me take your kids for the afternoon. That's peace. You want to talk about, oh, come let us adore him? When I hear that sound, I can't help but worship, all right? Peace is the sound of every student represented in this room that heard that the test is open book and open notes this time, all right? That's peace. Peace is when your employer comes and says, why don't you head home early today? That's peace. Peace is the sound that when the red and blue lights are in your rear view mirror, the officer walks up and says, I'm gonna let you go with a warning. That's peace. Where, where is peace all around us? We have these ideas, we have these perspectives, but if this is what peace is, then what went wrong with Jesus a couple thousand years ago? Because our world is not very peaceful in general. What, what, what are we missing? And, and how, how in the year 2022 could a baby being born 2,000 years ago be what brings us peace today? How does that even work? How does that equate? And maybe for some people, you're here today or you're tuning in online, and maybe something deep inside of you knows that you're missing something, you're lacking something, that you feel a little bit incomplete, you feel a lot not put together, you know that there's a break, you know that there's a void, you know that deep inside you're searching for something. And I wonder today if the gift of peace at Christmas might be the very thing your soul has been longing to discover. Lean in with me today. Let's go back to a, a couple hundred years before Jesus' birth. There was a prophecy about him. Prophecies were when prophets were declaring promises of God even before they would happen. So this is 400 or so years before Jesus' birth. And if you've been around church, you've probably heard this one before. Isaiah chapter nine, six through seven. It's a pretty common scripture this time of Christmas. This is 400 years before Jesus' birth. So the prophet is describing what Jesus is gonna be for his people when he comes. And Isaiah prophesied this about Jesus. He said, for to us, a child is born, to us a son is given. Isaiah said, and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of what? Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace, that was a descriptor of Jesus, which makes it that much more concerning in the year 2022 when we look around or when I look in the mirror and don't see peace, then what, what am I missing with the Prince of Peace in my life that either Jesus wasn't who he suggested himself to be or I'm missing something about who Jesus is in my own journey? More on that in a minute. I wanna finish the prophecy. Isaiah said, of the increase of his government, like his authority, his rule, and of the increase of peace, of the increase of Jesus's government and of the increase of peace, there will be no end. There will be no end to his peace. That's what the prophet says. 
on the throne of David's talking about his lineage and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore of peace, his peace, there will be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In other words, Isaiah is saying, because God said it, God's gonna make it happen. Peace, peace. So where is it for me? And, and, and maybe you're asking yourself, where is it for you? Am I doing it wrong? Did, did Jesus, what are we missing? Prince of peace. And I need to confess that as I was preparing this message, the idea, the concept, and, and even wrestling with Prince of Peace is one that I have far too often glossed right over. It's a term that I've heard many times at Christmas from this passage of scripture, no less. But think about that. Like the, to, to be described as a coming king known as the Prince of Peace, that must necessitate the gifts we celebrate at Christmas to be something much deeper than just Santa dropping his bag and heading off to the next house. That he throws some gifts and keeps on moving, that if Jesus was going to be known as the Prince of Peace, that has to be something deeper and certainly more sustaining than just to hand it and say, hey, here's a little peace. Good luck with your life. I'm heading on. But not only that, Jesus said, or the, the prophet said that Jesus would be known as the Prince of Peace. The prince of peace, the prince, his position of authority. Like he, he will be a significant leader, a ruler, an orchestrator of this, the prince of peace. Now I'm not an expert on this prince and king, queen, princesses and Dutch and dukes and all these things. I know a lot of you are experts because you've watched the Netflix series called The Crown and you know all these things. And we actually at Bridgepoint employ, this is really interesting. We look to the, the people in England. Bridgepoint employs three English nationals. They were, they, their origin is in England, which is really interesting. When we say Bridgepoint is to help people, all people get closer to God, apparently that even includes the losers of the Revolutionary War that are welcome in this space. And not that they're just welcome here, that we've employed them. So America, you know, welcome to the team. And one of our staff people married a British national. And so there's just a lot of influence here. They're the experts on it. But what I know enough just to be dangerous is that when the Prince of Wales, his authority is assigned from the place of Wales. And now the King of England that we now know, like that's a significant title of influence, of power, of rule and reign that is coming from the country of England. We understand, I know enough to know just that. Which means when Jesus is described as a prince, a ruling authority, it's one of the highest authorities of the time when Isaiah wrote that, his position of authority comes from peace. His status, his power, his rule, his reign, it hails from, it, it derives from peace. And what's really interesting is we read that Prince of Peace, and I've glossed over it a whole lot of times in my life, but the Hebrew word used for peace actually describes more of, it's, it's, it's a better translation of like completeness or wholeness. Jesus is the ruling authority that comes from a place of completeness or wholeness. That to be the Prince of Peace means that he's the ruler of positioning people to feel whole or complete. I wonder, I wonder if part of the reason our world feels so unpeaceful is because far too many of us are getting little tastes of it from your favorite radio personality or the sound of a river rushing or the beauty of a sunset or the quiet of a house where someone's keeping the kids that we get little tastes of those that remind us of what real peace is supposed to, to do inside of us, but it doesn't stay with us because it was never meant to. It was just intended to point us to a peace that would ultimately last, a peace that's not found in a place or an earthly relationship. I, I wonder if too many of us don't know peace because we're looking for the wrong kind of peace in the wrong kind of places. And so let me show you all my cards this morning as we jump into today's message. 
I want you to think about this big idea that sustained peace, ongoing peace, not passing peace, but deep inside peace, sustained peace is only available in the closeness of a relationship with a prince of peace, Jesus. That, that I wonder if what, what many of us are searching for to find peace on earth or to experience world peace is because we're trying to fight to acquire something that we were never meant to find in this world. Because peace wasn't supposed to be a cure-all for all the wrongs that exist inside of us. That it doesn't make right the hurt that is around us because we still live in a broken world. It's still affected by sin. It's still distanced from the God that intended to rule and reign over it. That peace in this world is only gonna be possible when, when we experience a peace that's not of this world. So what if this Christmas, what your soul, my soul, what we're longing for, the unrest or brokenness, the incompleteness, the cast aside or marginalized or less than feelings that far too many of us are wrestling with is because we're trying to find something in this world that's not actually from this world. And what if the peace we're searching for is only available in the closeness of a relationship with a prince of peace. There's only been one by that title, Jesus. Let me jump a few hundred years uh, later, all right? A few hundred years after this prophecy, Jesus was born, and we know that story. Ironically, that story was anything but peaceful. Jesus was born to a virgin, unwed mother. Those stories are not generally peaceful. Uh, Jesus was born in a season where they were traveling for a census. So he wasn't even born in, in the town that, that his parents were living in at the time. Jesus, because everybody was traveling and finding hotels and stuff, there was no room for them at the end. They had to get a feed eating trough in a barn. That's not peaceful. Joseph was trying to figure out what to do with his, uh, his engaged, to, his bride-to-be who's now pregnant, and it's not his own because they hadn't got to that place yet. None of these elements of the story was peaceful, and what if that's still pointing to the reality that it wasn't peace in this world, it was peace from another world that would create peace in our world, not around us. So jump a few, uh, 10 dozen or 10 or dozens of years later where Jesus has lived his life, he's taught, he's changed the world through the way that he loves people. He's died and he's risen from the grave. People are eyewitness accounts to what he said he did and, and what he ended up doing was enough for the human heart and soul. And there's a guy, an early church leader named Paul and I, I wanna actually jump to you to Paul. So a, a couple of 10, 10 uh Three or four dozens of years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul begins to write these letters. And, and what's really interesting is that peace wasn't like a byproduct. It wasn't supposed to be an accidental piece of the Christmas story. It was a key piece. Peace was a key piece of the Christmas story. Paul writes about it, and maybe he can help us understand how that baby born 2,000 years ago brought peace into the world and why it might matter for you and I. So let me, let me take you to Paul's writings, not to take my word for it, but I want you to hear how I believe peace really is possible for you and for me, and it's possible because of who Jesus is. Here's what Paul had to say about it. Ephesians chapter two, verses 14 through 16, for Christ, that's Jesus, for Jesus himself has brought peace to us. All right, Paul, thanks. Break it down for us. How did that happen? He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ, that's Jesus, reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Peace at Christmas. You're welcome. Head home and enjoy a peaceful afternoon. Jesus came to bring peace. Paul understood it. He was living it. And Paul had a radical transformation when he encountered Jesus after he had risen from the grave. But what is Paul trying to tell us today about how you and I might find peace in the year 2022 by simply looking back and discovering it in what Jesus has already done? Paul actually said the peace of Jesus was enough for all phases, all aspects, all possibilities of our lives, which is why it's a peace that can ultimately complete us or make us whole if we'll trust it and pursue it 
to be found in Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. Paul said there really is possibilities of peace in your life. And he kind of breaks it down into three categories. The first area that your life and mine can find peace is that we can find peace with others. We can find peace with others. That's pretty significant to understand, to posture our lives, to be able to be at peace with other people, because that's certainly not the posture that our culture that we currently live in today generally takes. And here's what Paul said to indicate that. For Jesus himself has brought peace to us. He united, that's a key word. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Let me help you understand what Paul's saying. There were Jews. We talked about this in our series on Galatians a couple months ago. The Jews were the Hebrew people, God's chosen people. They were pursuing God. They had developed a lot of rules and regulations to pursue God. They were blessed to be a blessing, but like any one of us, they'd gotten really sidetracked with their call from God. So there were the Jews, and then there was everybody else, the Gentile people. Some of the Gentiles may have believed in a God. It would have been the little G gods of the day. They may have worshiped the government gods. They may have worshiped some of the rulers of the day as gods, or many of them just flat out didn't believe in a God at all. And so you can imagine there was natural animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews thinking, hey, we're God's people, so try to mess with me. And they have a compelling argument. How am I supposed to win an argument with somebody that says, yes, but I'm a son of God and you're not? Which is why you could imagine the Jews being like, I mean, the Gentiles being like, it's not worth your time to know the Jews. They're just, they're just annoying in every sense of the word. They think they know it all. They have this direct correction, connection with God. And there was legitimate tension of the, at the time. Which is why when Paul said this, every ear perks up and says, wait a minute aren't you talking about some enemies here? That Jesus united Jews with Gentiles? Jesus Jesus united this race of people with the rest of the races of people because he made them into one? How? How is that a thing? How can that be a reality that suddenly these two people that have never gotten along, Jesus is saying, now you can get along because you need to live as one. Because what Jesus did was he stepped into a world, our world, that's really good at labels. He stepped into a world that's really good at divisions. He stepped into a world that's really good at clumping people together and creating reason to dislike other people. And when he did this, uniting Jews and Gentiles is what he said is, let me step into the midst of the division of the world and help everybody to understand their identity and who God says that they are. Listen to this, because this applies to you and to me, that because of what Jesus has done on the cross, Your earthly labels no longer carry the value of your identity. What does is that you are now known as a son or daughter or of the king or potentially a son or daughter of the king. This is huge because in a world that seeks to divide and in a world that seeks to have good reason to dislike those people or that political party or people that act that way or think that way or grew up from that space, that no longer is the division that matters in the eyes of God. What matters in the eyes of God is do you know how deeply loved by God you are? And you're either someone that has received the grace of God and know your worth and love in God, or you're someone that needs to. So what that means for anyone following Jesus is we now have the opportunity to live at peace with all people. Why? Because no longer is that party the problem or those people the problem or that race the problem or that issue the problem. It's it's a situation that I view the world as a child of God looking at other potential children of God. And how dare I reach a place to go before the Father in heaven and say, God, I need to come to you and talk about that guy or that lady and what they're doing because they're the problem. Because what I'm doing in that moment is going before the Father and complaining about one of his sons or daughters. 
Understand this, believers. There is zero room for racism in following Jesus. There's zero room for genderism in following Jesus. There's zero room to fight about politics in following Jesus. There's zero rooms to define other people as outsiders, excluded, or marginalized people in following Jesus because we all were sinners and Jesus died for us. You're either a child of God or a potential child of God, but the divisions of this world no longer divide those of us that have been rescued and redeemed by the blood of Jesus on the cross. We live united. You're clapping, but I'm not done. Because it means the person that drives you the most crazy the party, the lifestyle, the issue, the person that doesn't think like you, talk like you, act like you, or walk like you. That's a child of God. And how dare we assign a value less than that to them? We live united because Jesus united us on the cross. Paul said, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. And we live in a world that is so full of division. And I believe it's because we live in a world that doesn't know how deeply loved by God they are. The enemy will work really hard, work really, really hard to make sure that race becomes an issue in your mind, that politics is the dividing line genders, socioeconomic status, regions, nationalities, you fill in the blank. But believers, may we never forget that red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight because Jesus loves the little children of the world. There's possibilities of peace in your life with others because Jesus had freed you to love others as he loves them. But some of you need to understand that there's possibilities of peace within. And this may be the nugget you came to hear this morning because some of you are still stuck on the hamster wheel of life, working to earn and find your validation anywhere. At work, in a relationship, with a friend group, with a bank account, with a status, by earning a symbol of, of authority or position or power and everything else. But Paul said that one of the things Jesus did when he died on the cross was he did this, he, he united people by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. In other words, what Jesus did was to remind all of us that none of us will ever earn God's love. We can't do enough right. We can't avoid enough wrong. We can't be kind enough, sweet enough, say enough right things, do enough right things. We can't give enough to a church, attend enough. We can't hold our tongue enough that God would look down and say, you are deserving of my love. Because the Bible says that everyone has sinned and fallen short. And what Jesus was saying is the journey to earn it is over. Instead, we cease striving and rest in the grace of God. So listen, your constant pursuit of validation and affirmation, it's never gonna be enough. Trying to live up to being the best mom or the best dad, you're not gonna meet that mark. Trying to be, be, uh, live up to the accolades and the acclaims of, of work or in your social networks, it's never gonna satisfy. God came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We've got to quit trying to earn his love and embrace that we are loved in our imperfections. That's why Paul wrote this in Philippians, to double down on the idea of peace. Don't worry about anything. Quit trying to earn it, work it, exhaust yourself. Some of you are worn out from trying to keep up or measure up. And Paul said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. That's that gratitude loop we talked about a few weeks ago. Then when you don't worry, when you pray, when you talk to God, then you will experience God's peace. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Look at this. His his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. Yes, you and I are broken people. And yes, we are deeply loved by God anyway. 
the enemy will seek to disrupt your peace in your daily living by keeping you plugged into social media, by keeping you glued to news networks, by keeping you trying to find validation through your performance and keeping up to the point that criticism becomes crushing and your dependence upon praise becomes so much that you're living to satisfy people in order to fill the void inside. And when that doesn't happen, we'll turn to self-medicating, we'll turn to isolations, we'll turn to try to find our validation through other people, which just produces more stress, anxiety, and busyness in us that we will forever miss the beauty of the grace of God that is available not because we've earned it, but because he stepped in when we couldn't. There's possibility of peace in your life to live at peace with others. And some of you need to hear that it's possible to live at peace with yourself because Jesus said, stop trying to earn it. The third aspect that I want you to know that peace is available in is that God made it possible that you could have peace with God. God made it possible that you would have peace with God, you, me. God made it possible that you could have peace with God. Paul said it this way, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God. Those near him and those far from him, he reconciled them to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. It's a powerful statement that peace is available. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us us. Guys, knowing that in Jesus, God isn't still mad at you, knowing that in Jesus, God isn't ashamed of you, knowing that because he sent Jesus, God isn't embarrassed of you, that he's not trying to create distance from you, that he's not keeping the scorecard for you to measure up to or not, That changes everything. And instead to know that Jesus welcomes you, that Jesus wants to see you continue to grow into all you were made to be, and that Jesus' desire for you is to know him as a friend forever and enjoy life in that relationship relationship with God now and into eternity. That was his heart. That 2,000 years ago when God And his almighty nature looked out into a broken world full of broken people like you and me, that his response wasn't to turn and distance, that instead his response, as John put it, he put it like this, the word, he's describing Jesus, the word in response to our brokenness became flesh and blood that the creator became created, that the almighty one put on the confines of flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood, that he came to be near to you, to know you, to walk with you and so that you and I might know him. And we saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Peace is available because Jesus came. Why? Why is that true? Why is that a reality? Why would God step in to an otherwise unpeaceful world to bring peace? You know the answer. You've heard it all your life. Because just a few verses later, John said, this is why. For God so loved the world. Put your name in there. For God so loved you that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have eternal life. Stop fighting other people to try to keep up or to try to compare. Stop trying to earn it inside as if that was even possible. Stop trying to run from God who's not posturing himself to judge you and be angry at you, but instead in Christ to welcome you and to help you grow. Stop running, stop searching, stop looking, stop the rat race, stop the pursuit, stop the, the, the attack. Because sustained peace is only available in the closeness of a relationship with a prince of peace, Jesus. Jesus didn't come to, to wave his wand over planet earth and, and fix all the wrongs in this place. This world's broken. It's broken because I live in it and because you live in it and because I'm broken and you are. 
but he came so that in the midst of this broken world, through the hurt, through the pain, through the tears, through the stress, through the anxiety, through the confusion and the chaos, that one thing would ground us. One thing would be the space that we could stand on and be in a relationship with the Prince of Peace so that in the brokenness, in the lacking and in the incomplete, we might know instead the journey of becoming complete and becoming whole because we know the Prince of Peace. Thank God that at Christmas, he didn't run and just drop a few gifts under the tree, but instead he worked a gift that was too big to fit under that tree, but it would eventually have to hang on one so that our hearts and souls would be set free. Peace, peace on earth, peace for you and peace for me. Thank you, Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, this Christmas, would every heart that's engaging this, with this message just be willing to lean in? What if everything we're searching for is satisfied in all that you are? God, that, that knowing you isn't pretending that we're okay all the time. That knowing you isn't pretending that sometimes in this world we hurt that it's dark, that it's confusing, it's stressful, it's anxious. But instead, knowing you gives us a sense of wholeness and completeness that this world can't offer us. God, would you allow all of us this Christmas to better understand that your gift to us was a journey towards becoming complete and whole? And you can offer it because you're the Prince of Peace. May we accept that gift this Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First of all, if you've never explored the possibility of knowing Jesus as a friend, this Christmas I believe that's the most fulfilling thing that you could pursue. And I want you to know that you're sitting in a room full of people that aren't perfect, but are working to continually get closer to God because he's becoming a peace for us that this world can't offer. And maybe it's your turn. We have a prayer and care space online. You simply click a button in the room, out the doors to the right, balcony to the right, down the stairs. We have a prayer and care space of folks that would love to introduce you to Jesus, that you might know him as your Prince of Peace this Christmas. But today's also special because we're gonna celebrate baptisms. And when we celebrate baptisms, we get a little bit rowdy. I don't wanna rush you to the rowdiness, but here's what I want you to understand. You're gonna see some people that are coming forward today to make a public declaration that they've trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, here's what this does not mean. This does not mean that this is the faith decision. In fact, uh, baptism isn't the moment that they trust Jesus. Baptism is the reflection that they have. In other words, we describe baptism as an outward sign of the inward grace they've experienced from Jesus. This is kind of like a wedding ring. I don't wear this ring because this ring is what makes me married. I wear this ring to symbolize the vows that I exchange with my wife that make me married. There's nothing special about that water or that tank. What's special is that there's a God that is alive and active and at work in this world, and he's still in the business of transforming hearts and providing peace to people in the midst of an otherwise unpeaceful world. And that bridge point is worth getting a little excited about. So if as we sing and as we celebrate, you feel like you're lacking peace, or you're lacking passion when you see life change, don't leave Bridgepoint today without heading to prayer and care and finding folks that would love to pray with you and point you back to Jesus. But for everyone else, we're about to get a little excited because God is on the move and this is proof. You down with that? That's a good start. It felt better because you rolled the drums, but that's, that's not enough. 
I, I need to ask, let me, let me have you stand up, get the vocal cords loosened up because we're gonna sing and we're gonna celebrate. I said, are you ready to get a little rowdy in this space because of some life change today? God is at work. Let's respond together as we sing and celebrate. Amen, Pastor Tyler. I'm excited to worship and celebrate, especially with baptisms. And I know I was reminded of this uh, phrase that a lot of us have heard a lot before, but this uh, the phrasing the truth of no Jesus, no peace, right? When there's no Jesus, there's no peace. But when you know Jesus, you know peace. Amen? Amen, come on. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Fix your eyes on you, Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Show me 
Come on, church, let's celebrate. Man. I'm waiting for like the doo -doo -doo -doo. There it is. I don't know why, it just feels right. Man, church, let me tell you, if this is your first Sunday to Bridgepoint, welcome, man. I don't know how else you get introduced, but this is family. Uh, hey, here's what our ask of you is now that you just witnessed three people get baptized today. They're changing now back into comfortable clothing and you may see them in the atrium. So our ask of you is to introduce them and to remind them that this is family, that you are um, their family. So congratulate them. Tell them how excited you are for them in this decision of saying, hey, I am a follower of Jesus and I wanna tell you about it by being baptized, amen. Friends, a handful of things to share with y'all, so bear with me for just a moment. Christmas Eve is upon us, okay? Christmas Eve is here, all right? I'm just telling y'all, in case you forgot, please uh, throw away the Thanksgiving leftovers. They're not good anymore, all right? We don't want it anymore. Hey, so Christmas Eve is uh, available. Tickets are available now, so if you would, please reserve your tickets. You can do that through the QR code on the screen or you can grab um, one of the invite cards on your way out. Uh, it is free, just, you know, if there's any confusion, it is a free service, but we would like you to reserve a ticket so that we can accommodate the uh, amount of people that will be showing up and you'll receive a confirmation um, in your email with your tickets um, reserved for you and your family and friends. As well, Christmas Day actually falls on Sunday this year, so um, we will not have in-person services that day. We will have an on-demand message on our YouTube channel. So um, please, when you wake up on Christmas morning, take some time. Um, it will be available for you on Christmas Day on our YouTube channel. Um, as well, uh, January 1st, which is New Year's Day, we are going to be having one service church-wide, and it will be here at the Tyrone campus. So if this is the campus that you call home, there's nothing Nothing different apart from the service time. So it'll be one service on January 1st at 10.45 a.m. 10.45 a.m., okay? So all of y'all 11 o'clock people that I know you show up a little bit late, don't worry, I'm not judging you. Hey, 10.45, what time? 10.45, okay, January 1st. And the reason we're starting at 10.45 on that uh, New Year's Day is because our 11 o'clock service will be adjusting to 10.45 a.m. moving forward starting January 8th. So if you have any questions regarding that or anything um, in relationship to Christmas Eve, uh, New Year's Day, or this second service time switch up, please don't hesitate to ask, but that'll begin on January 8th, and New Year's Day will be um, in-person service here one for all campuses as well just a friendly reminder we have a members meeting after today's service at 1 p.m and it'll be in the west auditorium friends uh our mission here at bridgepoint church uh, you've heard us say it before and we want to say it again because it matters so much and it influences every single thing that we do and it's helping people all people get closer to god so hopefully that's become a part of your memorization and you know what to say when people ask hey what is bridgepoint about Helping people get closer to God is what we're about here at this church. As well, um, one of the ways that you help in that mission and fulfilling that mission is through your tithes and your offerings. So if you are somebody that gives regularly, thank you for investing in Bridgepoint Church. If you're somebody that has given once, twice, three times, thank you for investing your tithes and your offerings in what God is doing here at this church. Guys, we're excited. I hope that you're excited about all the things that are happening, that have happened, but the things to come, because let me tell you, God is up to something, and we saw evidence of that today. Amen. All right, friends. Well, hey, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. We will see you next Sunday. Go in peace.